Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Dr. Data Science. Today we're uh, having uh, Mr. Hos Biliadi, the uh, author of uh, the author of Machine Learning Guide, a machine learning guide for oil and gas using Python. It's a it's a very good resource for those who are uh, starting with machine learning in oil and gas, and it's also like for people who are already in in, in the field. And then he's, he's going to talk to us today about using the LSTM and the had the fracturing procedure uh, for prediction uh, purposes for the next uh, time steps of the of the process. Mr. Hussein, thank you for thank you for being with us today. Yeah, and thank you so much. It's here. Yeah, I will bring your slides uh, and then the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Atir. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, like wherever you're at. Um, and uh, so, so today we're going to talk about um, uh, Atir. You know, asked me to talk about you know the um, uh, you know using LSTM uh, for like hydraulic fracturing. And before we dive into actually the recurrent neural network and LSTM, let's talk about some of the fundamentals first, and then we'll dive into what LSTM is and how we can apply it actually. So first off, let's talk about the general concept. So let's just talk, talk, talk about artificial intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So artificial intelligence is basically using machine intelligence as opposed to using human or animal intelligence, okay? So as you can see in this picture, you have AI at the top. And then right, right you know, underneath AI, you have machine learning. Now, machine learning is a subset of AI, okay? It's a subset of AI. And basically, uh, machine learning is using um uh you know is is is, tr is is training a model is is finding hidden pattern from the data uh by by without explicitly programming it without explicitly programming it so the key word here is explicit programming you know so we're not like like for example when we're like when we do like like numerical simulation in the oil and gas industry you know when we use you know like like frac simulator or you know, CMG, Petrel, all these like like numerical simulation models, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're explicitly programming it, right? We're explicitly defining fluid flow through porous media and basically like solving equations, right? But but in machine learning, you know, uh, we're just using the power of data, whatever data that we have available to basically tap into that and extract valuable information from that data. Now, with that, there's a challenge, right? Because like um, your model is just as good as your data, so if you have limited exactly. data, then you have you know um, a, a a a limited model, right? So so just remember that you got AI, you got machine learning, which is a subset of AI, and underneath machine learning, which is what we're going to talk about today, uh, is deep learning. Okay, deep learning. Now, deep learning comes from the fundamental building block of deep learning is a neural network. Okay. And we're going to talk about what a neural network is and define some of the mathematical equations behind it. And then we're going to talk about, um, you know, one of the um, most commonly used type of uh, deep learning algorithms called LSTM uh, for time series data and how we can use that, like, for example, to predict the next second pressure data during hydraulic fracturing. So, so with that, so just remember, you got deep learning that is a subset of machine learning. And uh, usually the, the, the two most common types of deep learning algorithms are the uh, convolutional neural network, which yeah. are used heavily in, in seismic, you know, and, and fall detection, stuff like that. And then uh, the recurrent neural network, um, uh, which we'll talk about today, uh, that's the one that is used for time series data uh, it has actually a lot of applications in different industries, you know, um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, does it make sense so far? Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. So now let's go ahead and talk about uh, just a neural like network. I have like a simple, you know, uh, neural like, like network model here. I have these like set of input features. I have one hidden layer. And I have, you know, the output layer, which has, you know, one output, which is EUR or estimated ultimate recovery per thousand. 
Okay. So what we're trying to do in an ANN, in, in a, like a neural network, which is the fundamental building block of any kind of deep learning model is we're trying to minimize a cost function. And that cost function is simply defined as the difference between actual minus predicted values. And we're going to get into that like detail, like here in a minute, but just bear with me while I define this. And what this does, you know, these, uh, these are like, this is your hidden layer and each of these circles are your neurons. Okay. And, and just remember that neural network tries to mimic, you know, the human brain. That's, that's what it basically does, you know, except that the human brains have billions of neurons and they're all interconnected. Yeah. Like we're trying to build a similar model, but except this is a very, very simple form of a neural network. You know, now as the data increases, you can build these massive models, but you, it requires a lot of computational uh, power to do so, right? So, so here we've got an input, we've got a hidden layer, and we've got an output. And like what we're trying to do, so let's just say I'm going to uh, feed forward my model uh, you know, and, and just predict my EUR to be, for example, 1.5 BCF. Okay. But the actual EUR turns out to be 2 BCF. So you predicted was 1.5 and the actual is, is 2. So what this model is going to do is going to back propagate through these previous layers and changes the weights and biases of each of these neurons. Each, each neuron is going to have a weight and bias and it's going to change those weights and biases and then it's going to predict again. Like, like for example, now your EUR per thousand feet is 1.7, like instead of 1.5. Now you're closer to 2.0, which is the actual value, right? So now it's going to go back again, back propagate again, and predict that EUR again. And let's just say now your EUR is 1.8. Now you, you, you're getting kind of closer and closer and closer. So it's going to go through these iterations of iterations of iterations until this loss function yeah, it's like at minimum. Minimized. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, uh, I mean, um, and also, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, if you have like thought about it again. So, since like predicting the uh, the ultimate recovery, does this does this count as like a kind of a time series problem? Uh, and then, so my my concern is when we um, when we do a train triplet uh to um to like an ultimate recovery prediction do yeah. we treat that as a time series so we don't we don't go and then like randomly uh like do the train triplets and like we do it like in a kind of like a block style time series train yeah so th so this is just so this is actually using just a simple like neural network and we're not using deep learning for this we're just using you know a, a the simplest form of neural like network with one hidden layer and multiple, you know, perceptrons or neurons, yeah. you know, uh, now the, 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 so like, like, like the reason I'm showing this slide here is just to kind of prepare the audience for when we go into the LSTM, right. I'm trying to just build okay. yeah. what a simple, you know, neural network, you know, does before diving into D because like the LSTM gets pretty complex with all the inputs and outputs going in and out. Right. So, yeah. so, so I'm trying to kind of prepare the audience like step, step by step. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, so that's why I'm showing this. So for, for like, like for this, you know, if you have, you know, let's just say 500 wells, you have your input features such as, you know, sand per cluster, water per cluster, uh, stage spacing and all the other in, like important com like completions features, you can uh, build a, like a neural network model to predict your EUR per thousand feet by a simple neural network model. A simple neural network model. We're not using deep learning. We're not using any kind of time series analysis for this. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now let's go ahead and let me, let me show you this. this. This slide pretty much explains the whole concept behind the fundamental building block of a neural network. So let's just look at. I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. So let's just, just say I have my input features. You know, x1, x2, uh, dot 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 xm. Okay. And then I have my weight, weight one, weight two, weight M. Okay. And, and basically what a neural network model does, it takes each of these input features, X1, and it multiplies by the weight yeah. of that input feature, right? So you got X1 times W1, X2 times W2, XM times WM. Then it sums it up. Yeah. You got it. You got the summation of all of this, right? 
then what it does, it adds a bias. Yes. And this bias is this W0 term. And what is this bias? This bias is basically allows your activation function to move to the left or right. Shift it, yeah. To, to kind of shift it, right? But yeah. so now, after you, you add the bias, now you got to add a nonlinearity, a nonlinear activation function, which we're going to go over what type of activation functions you have. So, so you add this nonlinearity, and that's it. That's it. You basically got x1 times w1, x2 times w2, uh, dot, 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 right? And then you sum it up. You add the bias. Then you apply the activation, nonlinear activation function to this whole term. And this is your output. And then this is like what we are looking at is one layer only. It's Correct. Only this is not including any hidden layer. This is just simply, and an, I'm just trying to break it down to, to yeah. the, the very fundamentals. You got your, your input and your output, you know? Uh, now, as, as you add more layers, you know, of course, the complexity is going to go up, up and up, up. But basically, the fundamental is the same thing. It's just simply X1 times the weight, you know, plus plus the bias times the activation function. And as you add more layers, you, you're just going to get more more convoluted, of course, you know. Uh, but but as long as you understand what it what it does fundamentally, then the rest should be pretty easy. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? You're, yeah. You're basically just adding like keep adding layers. One correct. After one and, yeah. Correct. And you could have, you know, you could have, you know, uh, two, three hundreds, tens of layers, you know. Uh, but 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 now the the, the 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 question I always ask is, can you solve the problem? Can you uh, simplify the problem uh, exactly. and and just solve it with maybe one or two layers as opposed to going in and just adding so many layers? I think. One of the issues that I see, people just keep adding a lot of neurons yeah. and a lot of layers, and then the model gets overfitted, right? Yeah, exactly. And and that's you want to build a model that is general. So adding just so many layers, it just that gets all the problem. Yeah. It, it, it gets too convoluted, right? And and you don't want to. <laughs> uh, if you can solve the problem with just a couple layers or one layer, you know, and 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 then get good accuracy. Then you don't need to go and just keep adding more complexity to it, right? Because because the more because in 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 like by definition, the more neurons that you have, it just means the more complex your problem is, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the model will start kind of like recognizing the noise in your data as the yeah. like, as signal. Uh, yeah, and it will be like very uh, let's say. Uh, very overfitted model. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's 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 exactly right. So, so now the next slide is, look look at look at this slide now. So this is basically the same thing. I'm rewriting this equation that I just showed. Okay, the same exact equation from previous slide, using linear algebra. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm just vectorizing it. Right. So I'm just this yeah. is g, which is your non non nonlinear activation function. Your w zero is still your bias. Plus your this is the x t this is your vectorized form times 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 w you know and, and your x uh, is basically your x one through x m and your w is w one through w m so this is the equation that you guys see in a lot of the literatures you know when you guys go and you know read a book or you know read the SBE papers or you know whatever papers you guys read you know uh, related to uh, like neural network this is the equation that you guys see it's just the same equation it's just the vectorized uh format of it using linear algebra make sense so far yes yeah all right so now what is this nonlinear activation function right so this nonlinear activation function basically allows us to approximate um arbitrarily complex functions and, and there are different activation functions right here let me show you right here so you can see these activation functions you know you have you have, you have the identity you have the logistic you know you have the tan H, you have the arc tan, you have binary. These are different activation functions that you can use to solve um, like the problem. And, and also the, 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 qu the question that you might ask is, well, which one do I use? Well, that's a function of, you know, which one gives you the best results, right? So what, what we usually do uh, to make sure, you know, you got the best model is to do either grid search optimization, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, or even Bayesian optimization, uh, where it goes through different hypertuning parameters, uh, including, for example, the activation function, uh, to see which activation function yields the best result, right? Um, and then, and, uh, yeah. 
Well, when you do like the grid search, you do the grid search among the activation functions, you mean? Uh, amongst the activation functions and also okay. amongst other parameters. Like, for example, okay. how many yeah, neurons yeah. are you going to have? What kind of, you know, um, you know, how many layers, how many neurons, you know, the, the, like learning rate, momentum, all these um, hyperparameters associated with the neural network, right? So, so you can you can just iterate through all of these parameters, and basically it's just a nested for loop, right? Uh, yeah. it, it goes through you know at you know with with, with a logistic activation function, uh, okay. Uh, let's run the model with twenty neurons, okay. With the same logistic function, let's like run the model with twenty five neurons. 30 neurons and 40, you know what I'm saying? You can define those like specific. And you, you basically define your, let's say, I've, I've seen this implementation before, you define, they define like a range of, or like a dictionary of the parameters mm -hmm. that you want to perform the grid search on. Correct. And then Correct. the, let's say, the, 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 the for loop will take care of like all of the logistics. Correct. Correct. That's, that's, that's exactly right. So you can define, you can define a dictionary of all the, you know, um, you know, activation functions or all the integer values, like whether it's learning rate, momentum, you know, like whatever it is, you know, and, and, and then, and then like the for loop can take it. And now there's a library that, that takes care of that. The, the grid search library, I think in, yeah. in, in, in Python, uh, that, that does that automatically for you. Um, before that library was developed, we actually had a, a nested yeah, for like, loop. Write, like, write it down. Off. Yeah. Nested for loop, which was... <laughs> Exactly. It was like a. It was yeah. pretty pretty cumbersome to go through, you know. And then, and I wrote that, and then I found the library, and I was like, okay, well, <laughs> two lines of code. This is much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I love I love SK Learn because like most of the most of the tasks, like you perform them with a couple of yeah. lines, and that's it. It's like very simplistic. So so to sum up, there is no let's say a preference toward a specific uh, activation function. It's a very case specific. Correct. It's a case specific. It depends on the problem and also depends on the, the data, the nature of the data, you know. So it's just part of solving any kind of, you know, building a machine learning model. Part of that is just hyperparameter optimization, which exactly. means whatever model you use. And this is not just neural network. It could be any model. It could be if you're using like a random forest or, you know, um, a gradient boost or whatever model you're using, they still have a lot of these hyperparameters. Like, for example, in random forests, you know, what depth of the tree do you use? How many trees do you use? How many, you know what I'm saying? All these parameters got to get optimized, right? And 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 without the hyperparameter optimization, how would you optimize it, right? Yeah. Uh, so un unless you go through it uh, and, and do that nested for loop uh, to see which one gives you the highest highest accuracy, uh, now you can also use Bayesian optimization. I've tried that before too, where, where, where you know, uh, it, it cuts the time that it takes to optimize, you know, because with, with, with grid search, you know, uh, or even randomized search, it still takes time. You know, it, even yeah, with yeah. randomized search, you, it randomly like select a sub like subset of some of the, uh, like hyperparameters and it goes through those iterations, which is faster than grid search, you know, but it still takes time. Right. So, with Bayesian optimization, for example, it it, 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 can, it can solve it. It can come up to the optimum uh, problem uh, much, much faster, you know. And this is Bayesian optimization. That That's beyond the scope of this presentation. It's just a different. Yeah, yeah. I can talk about that for another three hours mm -hmm. maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a question here uh, from yeah. Stevano. Yeah. Uh, he says, I lost it. Did you use the library to understand which is the best activation function? In that case, what is the library name? Oh, oh, which is, uh, so you can use, um, as I said, uh, the, the, you can use grid search or, or randomized search. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the live, I think it's part of the scikit-learn, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, they have, they have that. If you just type in just grid search, like library in Python or grid search, like scikit-learn, it should pop up, you know. Uh, you can use those libraries. And as, as I said, this this activation function is just one of the hyperparameters. You have so many other hyperparameters, you know, within each machine learning model that you develop. It's just one of them, um, and 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 that's that that's that's what I would use. Okay, makes sense. Yep. All right. So now, this is basically um, the loss optimization, right? So 
the objective of a neural network is to find the network weights that results in the lowest loss, right? So think about this as like, you know, your, your um, uh, you know, you guys have probably heard of, you know, the gradient descent, right? Yes. Where, where, where you're kind of trying to go from top of a mountain to the bottom of a mountain, right? And, and basically, as I said, the objective function is to minimize this, this, this J, like WO and W1, this is the loss function with respect to these two weights, the, 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 the you know, W0 and W1, right? So you're just, imagine you're at top of a mountain and you're trying to go down, you know, from top to the bottom, right? Like, like what, I'm, what I'm showing in this picture. So you're taking the gradient descent, right? You're taking the gradient of your weight, you know, weights. Like if, if you have yeah. multiple weights, you're taking the gradient of those weights, right? Um, and, and, and basically going down until you reach like sort of the lowest point. point. Yeah, which is minimizing, which is basically minimizing that loss function, right? So, so the 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 the, the thing is, you know, you in, you you initialize the weights randomly, then you loop until converge to a local minimum, and basically you compute your gradient, which is the which is which is your um uh you know uh, uh, I think it's like gradient the gradient of the weights. weights. Yep, gradient of the weights. You know, with respect to those weights that I that I that like that mm -hmm. I showed you, right? And then and then take take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient, and then you update the weights, and then basically you know uh, this is your 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 eta, which is your learning rate, you know, and basically you're going down until that loss function is minimized, right? And then how do you calculate the gradient and back propagation? If you go back to your calculus, that's chain rule, you know. If you guys, uh, I, don't, I don't know which which cat class it was, but 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 it was in in one of the cat courses, you know, that you took in college. You use a chain rule. Yeah, uh, to calculate the gradient in back propagation. They made us do that manually, actually, in the class. <laughs> yeah, we had to do it. <laughs> which, is, which is good it's because it's like it shows you uh, yeah, how things are implemented, like in, in, in for example, SK Lab libraries and stuff. Right, right. And that, that's the thing. I think the, the uh, you know, the beauty of college, at least, it teaches you some of the fundamentals that you need to learn, you know, uh, before, you know, I personally like, you know, some of the mathematic, you know, and also I like the practical aspect of it, you know, so I, so I study them both all the time, you know, but as, as you said, you know, you had to do chain rule by, by hand. Right. And, and, and yeah. now, and now when you use the scikit learn and it does that automatically for you, you're like sitting back and, and just smiling. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. You don't have to do this manual anymore. Um, right. I wanted to ask you about the, the, uh, because this is like something I always, uh, see people like talking about, is when you when you're uh, gradient descent uh, stuck in a local minimum, mm -hmm. like what are the what are the let's say the remedies to that? Like, or, or like how do you how do you confirm or like to a certain extent that okay this is not a local minimum. This is like the let's say the global minimum. Yeah, that's a that's a good. I, it's, I think it's like a very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's 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 a good question, but also it's a hard question to answer because it really yeah. depends, right? It's basically a one a one million dollar question. Yeah, what, one thing I would say is I would look into the you know some of the hyperparameters, like especially like learning rate, you know, momentum, okay. some of those um, direct hyperparameters associated with that, you know, gradient descent, you know, and also I would try. You know other models. You know, uh, instead of gradient descent, you can use uh, what it was it the LBFGS. You know, you can mm -hmm. use um, uh, the Relo. You know, what I'm saying uh, yeah. you can you can use the other models and kind of uh, compare and contrast. And and also one thing, one, one, like one more thing that I would do is if you're unsure about the the accuracy or the quality of your model well also also one more thing i was like i was, was going to say is like you always want to test it right so you yeah. you, so you, you like you build a machine learning model right uh using let's just say a neural network i would always have aside from the 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 70 percent training 30 percent testing for example you know i would all, all, always do another blind test you know where you uh, feed the model um you know yeah, you, you, new data. correct you save the model and and you feed it you know another set of data to see how it how it performs you know and and then and then if it performs poorly it just means there's a problem right uh then you go back try to figure out what the problem is right uh but but you know but if, if you're stuck in a local minimum and and you got you got problems 
Uh, I would definitely look into some blind test validations, you know, just making sure your model is going to hold up, you know, when you go to deploy in real time or like whatever you do. I would look into the, the hyperparameters, you know, uh, some of the hyperparameters that you have. And also, I, I, would, I wouldn't mind comparing, for example, when you build a model with neural network, you know, you can always try a different algorithm to see, you know, how, uh, what kind of results you get from using a completely, from using a completely different algorithm, you know. Yeah. Um, so so you, you, there, are, there are different steps that you can take to, to kind of mitigate it. But these are these are the things that I would do. I, I I think the like the best thing to do is just just blind set, blind set, blind set. You know, just just apply it and apply and just test it, test it as much as you can, just to see if if if, if there's a problem or not. You know, um, okay. yeah. Okay, Makes great. Sense. So you know, so guys, remember uh, set aside a blind set of data for your uh, for your model testing uh, in order if you want to like confirm if you're stuck in the local minimum or not. Yeah, 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 and and then so now that we understand the fundamental building blocks, right? Now let's go into what is LSTM, right? So, for, for, like, like you, you have the couple of main uh, different, you know, deep learning algorithms you guys hear about a lot, right? Is yeah. it's called uh, uh, recurrent neural network, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the other one is called the convolution neural network, these two, right? Now, today we're talking about recurrent, recurrent neural network. Now, recurrent neural network has a vanishing gradient problem, which we'll talk about in a minute, okay? So underneath, uh, so LSTM was developed, if I'm not mistaken, I think in, in 1997 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I apologize if I miss, miss, you know, missed the date. I think in 1997, um, it was developed to overcome the shortcoming of RNN. Okay, um, uh, so 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 what LSTM is? Let's just go over, for example, what an LSTM does. Right. So let's just say let's just like break it down and go into simple terms. Let's just say you know with with RNN, uh, if I, for example, have let's just say you know um, John um, uh, likes pizza and pasta okay and then and then so you got so john likes pizza and pasta dot okay now let's just say adam however does not uh likes um like for example burrito okay dot therefore uh john likes probably italian food right because he likes you know pizza and pasta, okay. pasta. Right. Yeah. So John likes Italian food. Now, the issue is you have Adam in between. Right. That likes something completely different that is unrelated. Right. Mm -hmm. So what recurrent neural network, do, uh, what, what I'm sorry, LSTM does, it has this forget cell, forget gate or forget okay. cell that forgets what Adam, you know, because like because mm -hmm. to make a conclusion, to make a prediction about John that likes Italian food. It has nothing to do with Adam. It has yeah. to forget Adam, right? It has to forget Adam. And if it doesn't forget Adam, then what's going to do? It's going to make a wrong prediction, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so yeah. So, John likes – it's a pretty interesting example, right? John likes pizza and, and pasta, dot. Adam likes uh, burritos, dot. Therefore, John likes Italian food, for example. To predict Italian, right? You have to forget what Adam uh, likes, right, or dislikes, or yeah, that's a great explanation because yeah. when I when I read about like the memory issue uh, in LSTM, I wasn't like quite sure uh, about the like whole like how the whole algorithm works, and then uh, the the problem of like the, the of the vanishing gradient descent a gradient uh, value, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the, the the like the vanishing gradient problem. You know, if you remember the gradient that, that, we, yeah. that, we, that, we, that we that we talked about, when those gradients get too small, right? Uh, it's going to be very hard good. to recognize, yeah. and that's exactly what vanishing gradient problem is in in RNN, right? And that's what that's that's why the long short term memory LSTM was developed to overcome that challenge. Is right? that something? Uh mitigated or like treated by uh implement like by adopting this forget gate concept 
uh, 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 that and also it has a cell state which is the long term also memory too so uh, i was actually going to explain the hidden state mm -hmm. uh the cell state and the input and walk you through this real, like real, real quick right yeah. so so in lstm you have three main i guess gates you have gate 1 which is right here uh and right here you have the forget gate and you have gate two, which is your input gate, okay? And then you have gate three, which is your output gate, okay? Mm -hmm. So the forget gate is, is precisely what we talked about five minutes ago, where John and, and, the, and the Adam example, it basically forgets irrelevant information. It forgets irrelevant information. Mm -hmm. Information that is not applicable, for example, to make a prediction going forward, right? So that's that's extremely important. Now, what gets feed into this forget gate are, 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 are a few things. You have the the hidden state, okay, uh, which is basically your short term memory. You have your cell state, which is your long term memory. So what the cell state does, it allows you to look at the entire, you know, those sentences, all of it, as opposed to so John likes pizza and pasta dot Adam you know, uh, likes burritos, for example, dot, therefore John likes Italian food. So before it, it predicts Italian in this case, it's going to go through all of those previous sentences. It's a long-term memory, right? And that's why it's called a long and short-term memory because it takes into account the long-term and the short-term. You see, see what I'm saying? So and, and, and yeah. So the whole information is still preserved, like of the data. We're not, let's Correct. say, yeah, Correct. we're not losing anything as we progress. Correct. That's that's precisely right. That's precisely right. So it takes into account the entire thing, you know, uh, and, and and that's that's the beauty of using the LSTM, and that's actually like where the name came from. It's long, short-term short memory, memory, you know, because it takes into account long and the short-term memory of the whole thing, you know, and and the way it does. So at each time step, let's talk about each time step. At each time step, you have the hidden state, which is the short, if you remember, when, when, I, when I say hidden state, that's the short-term memory, okay? When I say cell state, that's, that's the, the long-term memory, yeah. right? So at each time step, you're going back to uh, T minus one, previous time step, right? And also you're going back to, um, at each cell state, you're going back to T minus one, right? And then what you're doing is, so this is your input, your IT is your input at, at, at the current time step. So you have your input at current time step. You have your um, your your your, your short-term um, uh, or, or hidden state at previous time step. And you have your cell state or long-term at your previous time step, T minus one. They all go into the, the forget gate first to, to take into, to kind of take care of forgetting some of the irrelevant information, right? And now you can see that you have, you have the, the, the W you know, uh, IF, the reason we called it IF in the book was because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the forget, right? So it, it's F here. And, and then you have, you, have, you, have, you have these weights. So every time you see a, a, a W in a, in a neural network, it's most likely ref like, like referred to the weight, right? So yeah. you have the weight of, of that, right? So you have the weight of the, um, the, hidden state, uh, the, the hidden state, and you also have the weight of the uh, like cell state, right? And then there's this theta right here, that's your bias, right? So you have your bias. Mm -hmm. So that's why the reason why I covered, you know, this slide right here, like all these weights and bias prior to coming to the slide was because, you know, I'm sure you guys would have had a lot of questions. What is what is this weight? What is this bias? But but the fundamental building blocks are the same, right? If you go back to the fundamental building blocks are the same. So now going back here, and uh, now once you've gone through the forget state gate, the next gate is the input gate. Now you're gonna have the the hidden state. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so at the, at the next next, you know, you're gonna have the hidden state and your input going into this, and you're applying, uh, you know, this like similar weights and and biases uh, for two different functions. One is uh, the sigmoid or logistic function, mm -hmm. and, and and the other one is the tan h function. You know, and then you multiply these two together, and then you send it to the output gate. And then you send it to the output gate. It go, go, goes through um, like similar, you know, process. I have we, we have all the equations like listed one by one in the book. You know, you can you can follow through. And then it goes through that, and then it makes a prediction. 
And that's pretty much it. So you got, so the main thing about the LSTM, you got your forget cell, input gate and output gate. You know, the forgets gate, like forgets the irrelevant information. Then um, that process goes into the in input and then output. Now, remember the cell state, this long, long-term long memory, it, it, it takes into account the whole thing. You know, it takes into account the entire history, which is which makes it very powerful because in the past with RNNs, you know, um, you just know the short-term memory of it. You see what I'm saying? The, the best example that I can give is, for example, if if you if if you have a friend a tier okay, um, if you just remember for example what he did for you yesterday, right? That's all you remember, right? Because that's RNN. Now, if you want to remember what he did for you like in the past, for example, like five years or something, yeah, that's long term, and that's what the cell state does. That's what the cell state does. And that's and that's that's smart because you're still retaining the whole information that you have, like right. in the data set. Basically, you're, you're correct. You're harvesting. You're still harvesting like the whole information in the data set. Correct. 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 So so yeah. So the best, that's basically that's pretty much it about what LSTM is. And so what we did, you know, in this book, and and as I said, this was just for the the, the, the sake of like illustrating what can be done. We we took the you know, 60 second time step or window, you know, like mm -hmm. windows, you can actually change these window frames, you know, from 60 to like whatever you want. And then we predicted the next time stamp, you know, which is the next second. Now you can also do to predict the next 20, 30 seconds, for example, and that, uh, that, that would be pretty powerful, but you know, there's always limitations with that, you know? So yeah. LSTM is ideal for time series data for time series analysis of time series data. So if you're dealing with time series data, you're trying to predict what happens. That's when that's that's when I when I when I would use LSTM. Now, if you're trying to, for example, predict, for example, one value EUR per thousand feet, I think we talked about this the other day about, you know, like predicting ISIP or for example, breakdown pressure, stuff like that. Uh, those you can just build a, you know, a regular model. You don't need to use, for example, deep learning, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so LSTM is primarily used for time series data. If, you, if you're if you're pumping a frac job, that's time series, and you're trying to predict the next 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 timestamp. And we have you know we have the um, um, I don't know if I can share my let me share this real quick. Let me stop sharing this one. Okay. Uh, let me share. I think I had I had it up um, in the uh, right here. Um, I can share, share screen. I can share this one here. Can you see this this uh, this book here? Oh uh, no, I cannot. Okay. Oh. How about, how yes, about now? Yeah, I, can, I can see it now. So now this is the the example that we had. So you can see here we talked about. You know, let's go back up here. This is the picture that I just showed you guys. You know, yeah. it has all the stuff. And then the equations are basically here. And they're honestly not that difficult. I mean, if you can, you know, it's, it's not that many equations and you can follow through pretty much like like what it does. It's just a lot of these subscripts that are, that are, that are kind of confusing. Yeah, but the like old matrix of uh, Yeah, but remember, though, you get like F stands for forget, for example. I stands for input, you know. And for example... O stands for output, you know. So don't 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 let those so many W's and I A and I O and those yeah. things kind of confuse you or kind of intimidate you. You know, what I mean, it's the concept. If once you understand the concept, like the rest should be pretty easy. And 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 um, and also I think uh, so. If you go down here, we have we have the Python codes. Uh, this is the example that we start we start going through. Mm -hmm. Uh, the data came from uh, MCL, I believe. I pulled it up from its publicly available information. MCL, uh, which is uh, which, which they like, they're doing a big project with the Department of Energy, you know, and they published a lot of these stages in the Marcellus and has all the um, one second frac information. I just pulled a uh, like one of those stuff, and you can find the data also in this link here. And you you know, we walk through how how you can actually code it in Python step by step uh, right here, and and kind of go. Like goes through all the codes and goes through like what it does and building the empty uh, list for training the data for testing the model 
and, and then it, it goes to building that LSTM. Like, you know, we, we have to, so to build these LSTM models, you gotta, you gotta need to, um, you know, uh, do a pip stall TensorFlow, of course. You need TensorFlow for this. Um, you need like Keras, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so these are the like libraries that you can use uh, to like, like, like to like to build these models. And so here are the codes here for for building the model and also for adding these layers. You know, defining the activation functions and all the stuff that we talked about. You know. And, and it is, you know, it goes through all the iterations here. You can see all the iterations and, and basically, you know, step by step example on how you can actually deploy it in Python, you know. Uh, so that's what we did. And and, um, and and basically that's, you know, that was the whole point of this, you know. And, and um, so one thing that I'd like to also mention is that in the past, I would say 10 years, what has truly changed the game in deep learning has been one, I would say, lot of data we have a lot of data available now that has been a huge huge help right um and then also having like computation power you know uh like having you can deploy all these on the cloud you can use uh uh amazon's aws or uh microsoft's azure you can they're like not that expensive to experiment with them if, if you're not that you get yeah. some like, free credits yeah, yeah, you can use the cloud, uh, and 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 also you have you know we have TensorFlow, you know you have these library packages that has literally made it so easy to deploy these models, right? Uh, what would come in now is just understanding the problem, right? Uh, you know, combining domain expertise and 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 exactly. you know AI knowledge, right? Combining these two together and, and solving those problems, right? Uh, so, so that's what has made deep learning extremely powerful, you know, uh, and, and, a lot, and, and a lot of companies are, are seeing that and, and they're like, they're starting to use it, you know? So, yeah. Exactly. Like, we have a question here from Ibrahim. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, how can the algorithm forget or disregard the irrelevant information? Yeah, that's, that's exactly happens in that uh, okay, forget yeah, yeah. That, that, we, that we talked yeah. about, right? So it goes through the, the, like when it when it when it takes the the input, so at the current time step, it takes the the input at that time step, and then it takes the um, um, the hidden um, state at the previous time step, right? And then it also takes into account the cell state, which is a long term memory at the previous time step, and it feeds all that into the forget gate, which goes through the um, um, you know all, like all the weights, and then he applies that logistic function. That logistic function is going to give you what zero or one, right? If that logistic function is zero, it's going to drop all those uh, irrelevant information, right? And then if that logistic function is one, then, then it's going yeah, to keep that. that. Will be taken in consideration. Yes, that's exactly what it does. So if you look at the logistic function, that's exactly what it does. So uh, in my in my screen that I showed, I had logistic function that forget gate, you know, and that logistic function basically either, either drops it or or, or kind of keeps it, right? And it's just math at that point, it's just mathematics, right? Um, yeah. If it's zero, then it's, it's irrelevant. We have another question from Michael O'Connell. He's our uh, chief analysis officer who's attending also the session. Uh, yeah. How do you choose the number of parameters in the neural network? Uh, you mentioned keeping it small, how small, and how can you test the model for adequacy and adjust the number of parameters? Yeah. So, um, the, like the so the number of parameters in a you, when you say number of parameters are you talking about the input parameters or are you talking about hyperparameters? Because uh, I, um, I would assume maybe like the input parameters, like the input, okay. yeah, the input okay. features. For, for, that's that's a good question. So for input parameters, one thing that I think you know is it's like you know I like I've been in the oil and gas my entire career, right? So in the oil and gas, um, let's just talk about for example geology. Right, you have porosity, permeability, total organic carbon content. You have saturation. You have all these geologic features. So you can like literally have, you know, tens of geologic features. If you include all these geologic features that are collinear, right, it's going to confuse the model. Yeah. I promise you that. Uh, so the first step uh, in choosing the number of parameters, you can do a feature ranking. There are different types of um, you know, algorithms that you can use to do feature ranking and see which features are the most important features in that model. 
And then features that fall, for example, you can use random forest for feature ranking. Features that fall at the bottom of the tree, just throw them out, you know? Uh, and also features that are heavily collinear. If, if, for example, you calculated permeability off of porosity, why would you include both? Right? Exactly, yeah. You, you, one is I mean, also, also like uh, some domain knowledge. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some domain knowledge, as you said, you don't need to keep both porosity and permeability, right? Just drop out the one that, that is heavily collinear. And you can do just a simple, just do a simple heat map, Pearson correlation coefficient. Here's the heat map of, of, of you know, porosity perm, block density resistivity, and so on and so And, and the ones that have high, high collinearity, high, uh, like Pearson correlation coefficient or, or whatever you use, spearmint, it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, j just drop those features, you know. And you can also do other types of, you can do, there are so many algorithms these days. You can do recursive uh, analysis. You, you can do all, all kinds of analysis to figure out what features you need to keep and what not. But in my mind, to, to build a powerful model that really works and is simplified and, and it's, it's going to be um, not going to be overfitted, you know, uh, just yeah. try to simplify the model. You don't need to like have, uh, you know, I, I know it gets fancy to have all these layers and all these information in there, you know, uh, but but try to simplify the number of input features and that would that should help you a lot, you know, building a, a, a like a solid model. Okay, so we have um, a follow-up note from Michael. He says, actually, I meant the uh, neural network parameters, not the features. Okay, sorry. So that's, that's, that's good. So we provided some, yeah. Yeah. Information <laughs> on the feature selection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, for so for neural like network, as as you probably know, you've, you've done the sensitivity or the hyperparameter optimization. Like I was not referring to, you know, I was referring to minimizing or keeping the number of input features small and 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 you know not having for example that that's that's what i was re like referring to now for this for neural network i would focus on um the 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 most important hyperparameters that have the most impact on the model for example in, in a neural like network one is the number of neurons that's number one as as, as a lot of impact the other one is you know uh the kind of activation function to use that's number two uh, the other one is learning rate, you know, what kind of learning rate to use if you're using, for example, gradient descent, you know, um, uh, you know, just focus on the parameters that have that has the most important impact on the on the um, on the model itself. And, and what you can do is just use grid search and include them all. I mean, now you have the grid search library, just include them all in your in your in your um in in your like definition for example have a dictionary of activation functions have a diction and you know have a, an integer values for the number of neurons the number of layers and so on and so forth you know and, and that should help you a lot you know it's going to take more time computationally you know but it's going to go through all those parameters that have the highest impact to be honest with you each model is going to have uh a, a different hyperparameters that are more important you know so yeah. Uh, if if you need if you need me to give you the list of parameters to use in a neural like like network, I'll be happy to send it to a tier and and you know get yeah, back to you. Yeah, so we can yeah. share it like with the with the audience also. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I can do I that. Want to ask you, uh, like, ask your opinion about this. How yeah. uh, let's say how uh, useful is yeah. to uh, like when you perform uh, a modeling on a specific. Uh, area it's like to pickle that model and then use it somewhere else will that be a good practice yes no. um, what are your thoughts i i wouldn't i'm not a fan of extrapolation right so if you're picking a model especially if if that model was developed are, are you talking about uh, like developing mo a, a model in a certain geologic area or is this and yeah, in a certain geological area and then we pickle that model let's say for example and we use it uh not far from that area it's like yeah um i would be cautious doing that just because uh you know if if the geology for example completely changes now you, you know uh you're kind of extrapolating right you're kind of feeding you're kind of trying to predict um some of the parameters in a different geologic area and that model that you developed only has seen some of the samples, some of, you know what I'm saying, has seen almost a subset of the samples, you know? Yeah. So I would be extremely cautious doing that uh, just because, you know, 
my geologic um, areas change and you know and and I would if if I if, if you had a big area what I would do I would divide the area into different geologic areas maybe I would use k means some type of clustering to cluster the areas into the different like areas and then once you have those 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 clusters of geologic areas then I would do build a model for each area you know and then I would kind of compare you know those uh built model for each area with a general model for the entire area to see how you know the results from one area compares to the overall picture you know uh but at, at, the, at the end of the day i think what's important is to hone in on what you're truly trying to do and, and you know focus on that area but i would be cautious you know uh you know applying your learning from one area to, to another, another area, world. just because at that point you're you're going into extrapolation, you know, and mm -hmm. and you know machine learning does a good job with prediction and interpolation within what he has seen, right? But you yeah. gotta understand limitations. The limitations is, as I said, you're building a model from the data. You're not doing, you're not explicitly programming fluid flow and porous media or some of these equations that you've learned. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, like the information from the data kind of, kind of, kind of approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question on the LSTM. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you when you uh, did your, uh, uh, I'm gonna review the code later on, but I just wanted to ask you when you sure. did uh, the implementation, did you yeah. also because I've seen this before, did you also create like a t minus one variables set of variables and then like use them as also uh, predictors? Yeah. So what what I did, I, I used um, you know the first sixty seconds and predicted uh -huh. the next second. Right then, he uses this, you know, um, second two to sixty, you know, like one now, and predicting the next second. So it, it does, yeah. So basically, I did the same thing. So you have, and I divided data into test, uh, training, and testing, you know, and, and define those 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 empty like variables. Actually, if if you go through the like the example that I have in the book, it lists one by one exactly what like what was done, you know. Yeah, and then so, um, yeah. also I wanted to ask you. Uh, what are your comments on the uh, on the performance? Because usually, uh, when uh, when I perform LSTM on time series, it's like kind of a slow process. Yeah. Do you face yeah. that? Do you have like any suggestions how to speed that up? Yeah. So that's that's one of the challenges, right? You know, you have you know the like anything that you do, like develop with deep learning, you know, it's, it's going to take time to train the model, right? Yeah. Once the model is developed, if you want to apply it real, if you want to deploy it real time, for example, one thing that you can do is you can, you have two options. You can deploy it on the cloud, right? Yeah. Or you can deploy it at the edge, exactly. right? At the, like on the cloud, you know, there's going to be some latency, uh, because you're latency issues, yeah. right? But at the edge, if you deploy the model at the yeah. edge, you know, then you can, you know, that model has already been built. You can just deploy it at the edge and and just let it predict the next second or whatever you're trying to predict. It could be any any problem, like like really, you know. Uh, so that should help you with like like with the speed. But building the model, I mean, it's going to take time to build, right? And and um, it, it's just uh, it's just a function, and also it's just a matter of com like computational power. You just got to purchase more computational power if if that's that's truly the problem, you know. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, if if you're just using your 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 you know your your, your personal you know like PC with you know let's say eight CPUs for example, you know <laughs> you got <laughs> that, <that'll> be, <laughs> you're limited to how much like how fast you can go, you know. Uh, but if you're trying to really like deploy it, you can do it like real time deployment, you know, either at the cloud or at the edge. If you're really impatient, you can always try the edge route. Then you have to take that. Production code and just deployed on the edge, you know, which is a totally different ball game, by the way, you know, because that's yeah, a yeah. that's a different that's an IoT profession, you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Actually, it's pretty, yeah, it's just yeah, we had like one of, the, uh, one of the classes. Also, we were uh, uh, we were basically training the model and then uh, like completing everything in in, in spot fire and took the data science, and then, then we put the PKL file and then yeah. deploy on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I like that. Uh, actually, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it kind of connects back to what we uh, do here to deploy the model on, on, on the edge. 
and, and now I, I love what you guys have done. I just saw I just saw a link yesterday. I think with the latest version of Spotfire or or Tipco, you guys you, you can like like literally just uh, uh, import the uh, the Jupyter like yeah. notebook or the dot file yeah, now. That's yeah, why. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty awesome because <laughs> I would go in there, I would change, I would define my inputs and the output. Does it also automatically pick your input and output too when you import it? Uh, yes, you can, you can do that like pretty much uh, interactively also. Interactively? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that's that, that, that's pretty nice because like I remember the days when you guys didn't even have the Python scripts, you know, it was just R, you know? And, and yes, now- exactly, yeah. I, that was like yeah. I think 10 something maybe. Yeah. Yeah, being able to now deploy these Python script is definitely a game changer because that's yes, exactly that's, because you know, it, it gives you like access basically to a whole set of like set uh, of possibilities to, to yeah. like experiment with. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, that this is pretty I, I saw that I saw the post on LinkedIn yesterday. I was like, this is pretty cool. This is yeah. good. good stuff. We have a question from Jose. Uh he says, How do you deal with online models when your distribution changes from original distribution that was used to train the model? How do you define these thresholds? Yeah, so if your distribution changes from the original distribution, for example, let's just say you have one parameter that has, you know, such distribution. Now you have distribution that is completely outside of that, you know, distribution range. Uh, you, you'd have to retrain the model. You'd have to like, you know, uh, like I wouldn't try to use a distribution with in that was, for example, on the far left and then try to, you know, apply it to a model because now you're extrapolating again, right? Yeah. So uh, exactly. you, would, you would almost have to, you know, recreate another model. That, that, that's, what, that's what I would do. So I would honestly, every... You know, if I, it depending on the problem, right? How much data you're getting, but every like quarter, or every like couple months, just all the models that you have, just retrain them, constantly retrain them, and and now you know if you're using, for example, Spotfire or Power BI or whatever you're using for dashboard purposes, you know, just if you have a data automatically coming in, you know, to your dashboard, uh, and it feeds in new information. And you've already applied your Python or R scripts, you know, in your data functions in Spotfire. Now you can just, you know, constantly retrain the model, um, you know, like yeah. every couple of months or even like you can even put it, put it real time, you know, uh, like, 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 like if you want to just, just, just to make sure you get the correct, correct information. You know? Yeah. You have to, I mean, you have to have like a, a tool to monitor the, uh, the model drifts. I mean, if it drifts like from the, yeah. let's say, required performance yeah. yeah if it completely drifts uh, you know that then you gotta I, I would definitely like retrain the model like i would not extrapolate and you know uh, ju just because now you're just making a lot of assumptions you know that are that that, are, that were not part of your data you know and and that's when you get in trouble right that's, that's yeah. when you start like you know, extrapolating and say, okay, I, I built this model based on this data. I'm going to apply it here now. And this data is completely different. And, you know, you didn't really train a model. <laughs> and then yeah, machine exactly. learning gets, and then machine learning gets, gets, gets blamed for it. You know, oh, you did, you did, this is all, you know, this is not good, you know. So you got to be really careful, especially, especially I would say if you're in an organization, right, and you're trying to prove yourself, you're trying to show what, what the capabilities are, you know, you got to be honest and say, look, you know, uh, machine learning is basically is a function of the data that goes into it, right? Exactly, if the data yeah. that goes into it is just not, you know, has a complete different distribution than what, you, than what you're trying to predict, I would hone in on other, you know, type of like, like simulations. I would hone, hone, hone in on explicitly programming it then, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so so that's, that's, that's the difference. That's where the difference would come in. Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you so much, yeah. uh, Klaus, for your time. This is this is really a, a, a fruitful and an informative uh, conversation. Uh, do you have any any last notes or suggestions or? Uh, no, I, I appreciate uh, the invite and uh, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, I'm on, of course, on LinkedIn. If you need, if you have any questions, shoot me a message, uh, and I'll be happy to answer. And then to all our audience, don't forget to check out uh, this uh, this great book that written by uh, Hoss and uh, uh, Ali Reza. Uh, this, is, 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of this book actually. I have I have I have one at home. Uh, Thank you. Thank yeah, it, this is like this is a very good resource if you are starting, or like if you are like in middle career uh, in oil and gas. Uh, very detailed uh, code examples and then all other information. Thank you, thank you, host, for your time, and then uh, hope thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye.